Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Kingdom Speak with Pastor Daniel McKillop. Today, we are going to talk about not the mouse trap, but something similar called a snare. Welcome to Kingdom Speak with Pastor Daniel McKillop. So, producer Randy, yes. you are a woodsman of the ultimate. Have you ever set a snare? I have not. Yeah. No. I'm have not. Have you ever that fallen up. for a snare? I... <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, have you been snared? <laughs> that hits different, yes. as they say. Yes. <laughs> yes. We've all yes. been in a snare or two. So, welcome back, everyone. Um, yes. This is Kingdom Speak with Pastor Daniel McKillop. You are. Joining us today, maybe for your first time, maybe not. Uh, I read this review online a few days ago, and it's great to know that we are attracting new listeners. Uh, so hear, hear this out. Five Star Apple Review Podcast says, I just started listening not too long ago, and this podcast is great. These are very knowledgeable men, but also understanding men with wise words that everyone can understand. I love being able to listen because they share wise words with the Bible to back up what they say. And that is from Cheesy on Apple Podcasts. We will say amen to that. Can I get a amen? Amen. amen? Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. So thanks for listening. Yes. Um, one more five-star great podcast. Well done. If the world can have podcasts giving worldly advice, the church should more so be broadcasting truth in the podcast world. Keep it up. And that is from Chosen Damn. Generation, which I believe uh, yeah. Yeah, is another podcast. So thank you very much for that, Chosen awesome. Generation. We appreciate that, no. and we say amen. Can I get an amen? Amen! Can I get a hallelujah? Well, it feels a little yeah. different. It feels a little different in the studio here today. It does. It's it's not too different. It's not quite the same. You have to look carefully, but sitting over here across the table is a vacant chair. Yeah. And a hologram image. Oh yeah. Of the man himself, Pastor Daniel McKillop. So we were we were chatting about this on the weekend because as you know, Pastor Daniel McKillop is a traveling uh, superstar, if I may say myself. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I toned it down. I was wondering, I only, what, was, I was wondering what was going to come out. I only said superstar. I didn't go all the way. Yeah. And yeah. for those of you who don't know, he does travel and preach. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to continue podcasting and get episodes to you because there's such an extreme demand for these episodes around the world. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's, it's premium. It is. The, the premium demand premium. is there. Yeah, We've yeah, built the absolutely. subscribers and it's it's like a vacuum. When the when the podcast drops on Friday, you can hear it shooting around the world like a jet. So anyways, oh, yeah. long Puts story the short. Out in plus drop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All, lots of airports here. What's <laughs> All of that to say Pastor McKillop is online with us. So welcome. Welcome. He is a guest on Kingdom yeah. Speak today. Well, welcome to yes. your own show. <laughs> we're so glad you were able to be here hey, today. <laughs> it's an honor to be with you guys. You guys, uh, we I follow your stuff, and you're just amazing. So oh. thank you for the invitation. Oh, thank you. It, 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 it means something to know we're affecting people like you. Yes, yes, I, yes. I appreciate that. Yes. Yeah. That being said, we do want to get on with the podcast, so pardon all of our random yes. Yeah, so babbling I'm in bit. I'm in Belize yeah so why are you in Belize let everyone know what's why Belize so for those of you that don't know uh, my brother is the lead missionary uh, of the family worship center here in Belize and so for the first time in I was actually here when COVID right first kind of reared its ugly head mm -hmm. I had to come home early and and quarantine mm -hmm. because I was here. So mm -hmm. it's just good to be back, man. The development in the, in the properties is amazing. 
Cool. Um, we've got we got service tonight, so looking forward to to being with them in church. So they've been working hard. Uh, they got a, a, a Christian school started. I'll try to get some pictures and, and share them. It's it, they're doing an amazing, amazing job. So yeah, it's, really it's cool. good to be here. Yeah. Uh, we should get him on the podcast sometime. You know, absolutely. That would be an awesome I, show. I actually tried to get him on today, but he, he died. <laughs> yet, so. uh, yeah. So what do you want to deliver to the audience from the other side of the world? What do you, what do you, what do you want to talk it, about today? It, it's your podcast. So I'm, I'm just here to be. All right. All right. Be a blessing. So I, yeah. I'd like to talk about <laughs> snares. And, yeah. Okay. And, and, and maybe work it in with some sort of like a love relationship. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. You guys know uh, Pop Townley. Mm -hmm. so of course. Our, our, the legend. <laughs> yes. Our mm -hmm. guest last week's uh, Pastor Wade Townley. Mm -hmm. Great episode. He, um, his daddy is the consummate. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, you say woodsman, everything, outdoorsman, maybe that's, mm -hmm. that's probably broad enough. So he um, has an uh, uh, an ability to take wild horses, and yep. he done it one time for one of my brother's horses, and and he he he, he snares them. He literally does. We were in Bangor a few days ago. And the borders just opened up, so we were able to drive over. Pop was there. So he is having a, a conversation with my son. Mm -hmm. And he reminded him that he still has on his bucket list. He wants to come to New Brunswick and snare a moose. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would go on that moose hunt. Man, I want to yeah. be the videographer on that. <laughs> oh, said, man. Viral. He says, if, yeah, he says he can do it. <laughs> it wouldn't. <laughs> uh, another interesting mm -hmm. anecdote about Pop Townley is those of you who know him, yeah. if you're ever around him, get talking about his hog hunting stories. Well, yeah, and he so pulls out his, his he pulls out his phone, right? Yep. And he's got all these yep. videos on his iPhone. It's this iPhone, you know, in this giant otter box case. But he gets flipping through his phone, and he'll show you videos of. And this, every picture has a story. Everyone. Yeah. Incredible to see. And he wants to add yeah. a, a snaring a moose oh to, my word. To, the, to the hogs, the horses. And he's convinced it can happen. He would try it. Yeah. He's got that level yeah. of boldness to I him. I think yeah. Uh, yeah. me and the co-host will have to make sure the <laughs> DNR officers are uh, <laughs> occupied it, elsewhere. Is it illegal? Yeah. Yes, it's illegal. No, but if you had a tag, it's still really? illegal. I don't think you can snare a moose. No, even during moose season. You're saying well, you don't think because you just don't think it could happen or legally. No, 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 legally, legally. Uh, if you are a DNR officer listening to this podcast in yeah. Canada, let us know. Yeah, we must have a forest yeah. ranger who listens who could even in the states who, you know, could help help us out with that. Yeah, I I would like to see that YouTube video for sure. I would I would watch that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yes. So we're going to talk about relationships today. Mm -hmm. and, you don't uh, say you could be snared by a relationship, do you? That's kind of what, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oof. I, I, I hate to be diving off into that right away, but the um, we'll unpack this a bit farther in a moment, but mm -hmm. 1 Samuel 18, and if you read just the 20th, Sure. And 21st verse. All right, let's read it. First Samuel 18, 20 says, And Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, yeah, he, I yeah. will give him her, that she may be a snare to him. There it is. That she may be a snare hmm. to him. What, what was the end result that he was hoping for? and that the hand of the Philistines may be against them. Yeah. Wherefore Saul yeah. said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of the twain. Right. Wow. And that was quite a plan. <laughs> it was a devious thing. It's a devious thing. So let, let me just throw this hook out there, and we'll come back to it. But you, you got to be so cautious about what you fall in love with. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. because what you what you enter into that relationship with becomes someone mm-hmm. that if if they have ill intent they can use what you love mm-hmm. for their purpose for their purpose so Saul obviously knew that that Michael and David loved each other that's right and he wanted to use that for his advantage to gain uh, a well, let me say this, not just a gain, to preserve his position mm-hmm. in the kingdom because he viewed David as a threat. So relationships are powerful stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're powerful stuff. Yep. Relationships are both, uh, maybe, maybe I could say it this way, both horizontal and vertical. Mm-hmm. There is, There's relationships that you have with Jesus Christ, and then there's relationships that you have with everybody on a horizontal level. Mm -hmm. And ironically, that that forms a cross, and I think a good, without being too uh, smug, Mm -hmm. I think that, that the cross needs to be the center point by which every relationship is defined, forged, or abandoned. Hmm. Jesus, that while he was at the cross, Jesus forged a relationship with one thief. He abandoned a relationship with the other one. That's very good. At the cross. Hmm. The cross becomes or should be for the Christian where we where we forge and abandon every relationship. And if if there response to the cross is not favorable, then at that point we need to say, okay, then I I just don't see us going forward. Hmm. Wow. Um, Let's read the third chapter of Amos. Yeah. Do you want that KJV or Amplified? Well, let's do it in the Amplified. Okay. Amos 3.3. 3. Do two walk together, except they make an appointment and have agreed? Good question. Yeah, that's a loaded question. That's, that's a, it that's is. Question. Yeah, it's kind of a intriguing and maybe even, could we say, rhetorical question, a line of questioning, because he knows the answer to it. Right. Mm-hmm. He's not asking for a revelation he knows that two people cannot walk together unless they'd be agreed Mm -hmm. so so when we are talking about relationships amos is letting us know first and foremost that they are never stationary they're always evolving Mm -hmm. he describes it as a walking with them yeah so when i form a relationship with whether it be on a friend level, whether it be on a more intimate level, uh, if, if I'm single and I'm looking for a spouse, mm-hmm. if I am just looking to expand my circle of friends, it's important that we enter into these pursuits with an understanding, as we've already said, that the cross needs to be front and center to the forging of that relationship. And then that relationships are progressive. They're fluid. They're mm-hmm. always moving. Mm-hmm. A, sta- a stationary relationship is a stagnant relationship. But you're walking. You're, 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 you're mobile. And as you walk, mm-hmm. as you walk, you have to. I'm just wanting to, to let, let, me, um, let me read something to you here. Mm-hmm. You can walk together with someone accidentally. For a few moments, yeah. But with right. but without coming to an agreement, yeah, you quickly will cease to be together. Oof. Wow. That doesn't that doesn't mean that there has to be this major blow up for you not to be together. No, that's but right. The fact that two people are are together and walking means it demands 
here's a here's a here's a, de- a word that sometimes we shy away from, but it demands compromise. It demands right, that, right? right? Yeah. One sure. guy, or one one particular party, if if their stride is a little longer, mm. this this guy's gait is a little shorter, then someone has to compromise, or else the 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 amount of time together evaporates mm. just by the forward motion of the relationship. Well, producer Randy and I have been friends for, for a few years and we fight constantly. So that's really encouraging to hear that we yes. must, we must be walking together it is. and I find myself compromising all the time. I can't, I can't stand how slow you eat <laughs> your food. <laughs> If we could just solve this one problem, we could get on with life. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's true, though. When you see, you know, and you're much older than us. Much. Uh-uh. But if you're going to have a friend for multiple years, and if the friends that you've had over the years, you do go through seasons of somebody disagrees over something, but yet you, you like you said, the word compromise is, is a, is the excellent way to put it, where you say, you know what, in spite of that, we're still going to be friends. And you do this adjustment. You and, don't and terminate the relationship. This, exactly. Well said. I I think some of this comes from the yoking that takes place in a relationship. Hmm. If you're going to enter into a relationship with someone, there is a yoking that happens that helps you stay together with them Mm -hmm. so that you're not always abandoning the relationship and looking over your shoulder and going, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm farther down the road than you are. That yoking keeps you together. Mm. And that, that is why you read stuff like Paul writing to the church in Corinth and cautioning them. Right. Right, that's the familiar passage of don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. So the reality is, and he and and, and he goes on to say, what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? Right. Uh, Light and darkness. Right. So the the light does not make a decision that it's not going to be yoked with darkness. Right. The nature of of both elements, although we know darkness is not actually a thing, it's the absence of a thing. But in this case, the apostle is saying, you you don't have to go, well, I'm light, so I can't fellowship with darkness because you're just not light. No, by reason of their the attributes and mm. that organic core of who they are, mm-hmm. the presence of one obliterates the other. It, it's, right. it's just there is no way that there can be communion yeah. or fellowship. Yeah. I do not have to be offensive to an unbeliever. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't be, let me say it that way, offensive to an unbeliever. Someone... Someone who is walking in the light mm-hmm. doesn't need to be ugly to those that are in darkness mm-hmm. to prove that you're not yoked together. <laughs> just, just by reason of being light, you will outpace darkness. Just keep being you. Yeah, yeah so true. If you continue, if you continue, that is why. Okay, going back to what we just said, that is why for a few moments you can come along somebody Mm -hmm. and you can introduce the gospel to them and you can try to develop enough of a relationship with them Mm -hmm. that you can impact them, you can evangelistically reach them, can be Christ to them. But if their adherence to darkness remains so tight, then the necessary compromise is not there for you to continue to walk together. Wow, that's very good. Very well said. That makes sense. Very well said. So, um, 
relationships can be pretty tricky. I don't know if you guys have noticed that or not. You know, every single relationship I've ever formed in my life has gone perfectly. I don't know what you're talking about. Coworkers, <laughs> fellow friends, yeah, neighbors, physical neighbors, family, family, in-laws. You're, you're on to something. Woo! And they've oh. all worked for you. Yes. Every every one of those can be a landmine, can they not? So, yeah. Yeah. Do you care to describe which one you're referring to? <laughs> All of the I mean, above. You have, a, you have a platform here. Go ahead. All of the above. Take your liberty. <laughs> I'm just not feeling the words right now. I'll just turn it back your, to you. <laughs> your relationship with me as a boss, not just as a pastor. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a relationship. You know, you and I have actually had those discussions where, look, our roles are changing. We're going to have to, to consciously work to maintain a good relationship, right? Yes. That's absolutely that's key for any one of us to understand. Very I, true. I think I think the closer that you get to someone, the more uh, dedicated mm -hmm. you have to be to keep that relationship alive and mm -hmm. working. Definitely. A husband and wife relationship can just by reason of of proximity. Yeah. You you stop sewing into it. Yep, sure. And, and and the temperature begins to You stop doing the things that built the relationship and you stop building. Right. You know. And then by extension that affects you because when you first formed that relationship mm -hmm. at that level of intimacy it was I need you in my life so that I can become mm -hmm. what I am supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I need you to be a part of this team so that you that we can accomplish what God has for us to accomplish. I need you to be a part of this company so that we can hit the targets that we're, that we're trying to hit. If you're not exactly. careful, then by reason of proximity, you cease to invest in them. Mm -hmm. And then by extension, that relationship begins to deteriorate, yeah. um, which ultimately affects the purpose that, that, that you formed that relationship in the first place. Abraham and Lot and their relationship yeah, and how it evolved mm -hmm. was so intricately connected to Lot's or Abraham's purpose, and their relationship affected everything. And everything. You know what strikes me about that story is how people people can have relationships with you and then they can leave, and you got to recognize that that was that was for a particular time in your life. And not feel like it was a failure. Oh, yes. So well said. Yes. And there's there's nothing more tricky than that when that is with family. Yep. Yep. There are times that the purpose and the calling of God can beckon you to a walk mm -hmm. that requires you mm -hmm. to forsake the mm -hmm. intimacy that you have with some relationships. Abandon them, Abraham. Leave your family, your kindred, your tongue. Walk out. And he's saying this to a guy who's an old guy and is, has been hanging around his parents his whole life. He's yeah. like, it's time for yeah. you to leave now. <laughs> it's time to get out. Okay. And he's also talking to a man who has no progeny. Nope. No children. Nope. So you know that his nephew was his boy. You do know that. I mean, yeah. by yeah. by extension of the vacuum of relationship, father-son relationship in Abraham's life, Lot had become that yeah. to Abraham. There would be a connection there for sure. Right? Yeah. And so the calling of God was beckoning him. It wasn't saying that he had to be nasty to Lot, mm -hmm. that, that they could never see each other again, uh, that they couldn't FaceTime each other. No, that they couldn't, of course. Uh, that's not what he's saying, but he is saying the intimacy that you once had, the access, you've got to leave him, Abraham, and you have to pursue uh, what, what I'm calling you to pursue. Mm. So here's, here's an important statement. You will never finish your life with all the same relationships that you started it with. Wow. I think if you're over the age of, you know, we use the term age of understanding, but you see that, you know, I'm the ripe old age of 34, boys. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm getting up there. But in my short lifespan, I've, yeah, you totally see, you see it. How many, how many listening to us today would attest to the fact that who your best man was in your wedding, who your maid of honor is, may have even moved on and you look back oh. 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, and you look at who your wedding party was comprised of. Not everybody, not everybody. No. But undoubtedly, some of you have moved on in different directions from that point. For sure. It's just that. It's, it's moving. It's right. because they're always moving. Always and, in, moving. and in their lives, they have, they have a new best man too. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Here we yes. always think about just us, but those people may need to move on for their purpose to be accomplished too. <laughs> right. Okay. And the ones that have maintained that degree of uh, proximity with you, they're, they're still in your life. If you're honest with yourself, even, even those relationships have gone through cycles of varying degrees of mm-hmm. intimacy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Paul and John Mark, there mm-hmm. was a season where, and I don't want the guy traveling with me, just, just keep, your, keep your distance. So managing relationships becomes um, a very critical Mm-hmm. responsibility mm-hmm. if you want to live a successful life mm-hmm. because there are some people that God brings into your life that are simply scaffolding. They, they were brought in to help you construct the permanency of a structure, but mm-hmm. they were temporary. So if, if you're building a, and, and you're on a construction site and you are building a uh, beautiful edifice, mm-hmm. That, in the early stages and in the unfinished stages of construction, you walk in there expecting to see that. But at the ribbon-cutting ceremony, you don't expect to walk in and see scaffolding. That's a problem. Right. So you see that happening with Abraham and Lot. He is, he's, he don't want to let Lot go. No. And it must have been a comfort thing to him, right? Totally. Yeah. Totally. A familiarity. Yeah. I'm, yep. I'm, I'm stepping out on a voyage that I don't know anybody. Uh, God's calling me out mm-hmm. of my comfort zone. So can I at least keep this relationship? Hmm. And that's not making Lot the sinner necessarily and Abraham the saint. That is just a reality that, that God can reach into a youth group, elevate one particular young man out of the youth group call him to a purpose that changes the relationship that he will have with the rest of that youth group forever that doesn't mean the youth group's backslid no nor does that mean he is worth any more than anybody else but if he refuses to abandon Mm -hmm. the 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 lot in his life then, Sometimes you got to cast then, lots. My God, can we get an amen on that? Yeah. Man, if I was running the switchboard right now, I'd Bible bomb that. <laughs> 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 All right. So let me ask okay, you. Without, let me I ask, just say this yeah, first? Go ahead. Part of the problem, and I don't want to get stuck on poor Lot and Abraham here, but part of the problem mm-hmm. is that Lot only had a relationship with Abraham. Abraham had a relationship with God. Oh, wow. I will Bible bomb that. Very, very key. So Mm. you have to have, when you're going to walk by faith, you want the people around you to not just have a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. You want them to have a relationship with God. Wow. That's key. Go ahead. You're going to ask a question. So how... How do we end up getting snared by relationships? How, where do we go off track? Um, great question. I think, I think that one of the contributing elements of this is because we all have relationships on every different level. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and we might as well be honest. Not all of them are worth the same thing to us. No, no, no. There are some relationships that, that, 
if if we think we had a, a close brush with this a few weeks ago in our family of losing my dad. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, woo, I don't want to think about it. Mm-hmm. There are other people that if God took them out of my life, the relationship is not as intimate mm-hmm. with me. So I, it would be easier for me to move on. Mm-hmm. Abraham and Lot, again, Lot meant a lot to Abraham. That's why mm-hmm. he brought him. Mm-hmm. So how can I get snared by something? I think the first ingredient that has to be there for you to be snared is love. Hmm. Um, I, I can't, I can't be, I can't be snared by something or let me, let me rephrase that. It's more difficult for me to be snared by something that I don't love than yeah. it is to be pulled by something that I love. And, and that brings us back to, the text that we started with, with um, Saul seeing an opportunity with David. Very true, yes. And, and, and Michael's relationship. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, I, I think, let's set this up just for a minute. So, so Saul, Saul is uh, a very insecure king. He has a throne, but David has an anointing. Mm -hmm. And a man that has an anointing is always a threat to a man that only has a throne. (laughs) Woo! That's the truth. Always. Uh, There's something riveting about the anointing. The anointing will bring people to you when you don't even have anything to give them. The the fact that men came to David in a cave when he had no positions to give them. He's got no money. He's got nothing. Oh, bro, their, their mindset was this. If they weren't knocking on Saul's door, who had all the pomp and circumstance and royalty and, mm-hmm. and pageantry and 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 all of the fine dining and the servants, Mm -hmm. he could give them a position. But there were more men that were knocking on the entrance of a cave because they had the, this was their outlook. They would rather be in a cave with an anointed man than in a palace with a man that had lost his. There's just something about the anointing. People will go anywhere to find it, won't they? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And so the anointing affected Saul and David's relationship. It made, okay, Saul is a man that's tormented. Saul is a man that is intimidated by the Philistines. Mm -hmm. He's intimidated by Goliath. Mm -hmm. Okay? He had had been under the, the spell of demonic influences and evil spirits. God had lifted that covering off of him that would have protected him from those evil spirits. And guess who he would call when he was fighting those evil spirits? Yeah. He called David, and David would come in mm-hmm. and with the harp begin to sing and the anointing that was on David's life. Listen, the anointing was not just on David to 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 propel him to a throne. Mm -hmm. But the anointing was something that affected every facet of David's life. The Mm -hmm. anointing affected how he wrote, how he sang, how he played, how he interacted with people. If God's ever anointed you and you feel like you've got an anointing to be in ministry and an anointing to, to fill a particular office in the ministry, one of the worst mistakes you can make is thinking that it will only be activated when you get the throne. Yeah. David. That's a great point. David allowed the anointing to change every facet of his life. He was just as anointed in the cave as he was when he finally sat on the throne. Think of all the stuff he did way before he ever got to wear the crown. Uh-huh. The anointing is super natural. 
Mm. It takes everything that you do on a natural level and it adds a super natural level mm. to it. And that was the magnetism that was pulling those guys to David in a cave. No red carpet. Yep. No, 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 no office of administration. No, no minister of defense. No treasury secretary. None of that. David had nothing to offer them but the anointing. Hmm. Nothing. And so this really troubled Saul because I think Saul could read the tea leaves. And, He's quite obsessed so, about it. Yeah, he sure was. Yeah. Saul is um, he's intimidated by Goliath. He's intimidated by the Philistines. He's intimidated by David. And so this anointing really changed their relationship. And so David goes, leads the charge when Saul won't go to, to fight. Saul should have been the one that led the charge against Goliath. But David does it, brings the victory. Now, there is a bounty that Saul had put on Goliath's head. That's right. And David, I mean, anybody with any theological background at all knows this story. David looked at at his brothers and goes, is there not a cause? Like, are you you kidding me right now? How come you're not fighting and, 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 and confronting this raging, uncircumcised Philistine? How come? Well, 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 I'm hiding down here behind this rock, and, and if you think it's a good idea, the king will give you tax-free existence, mm-hmm. and the king will give you his daughter's hand in marriage. That was the bounty that was on Goliath's head. David goes, is there not a cause? In other words, is there not a cause that extends beyond the economic impact that, will, that, that taking a stand will have for me beyond the impact of being married into royalty. Clearly, the bounty wasn't enough to give unanointed people the courage they needed to confront the Goliath yeah. that was there. Isn't that true? That's exactly right. right? Yeah. So the bounty wasn't what pulled him into the struggle. It was the anointing that empowered him to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're in it just I, for the bounty, you're in you're whoa. in trouble. <laughs> yeah. You you you'd you be behind a rock. <laughs> you can feel it talking about it right now because the anointing is that thing that empowers you to confront things that bounties will never, never make you do it. And so David comes home from that struggle and that conflict and that ultimate victory. And brother, he is the consummate homegrown hero, the town goes crazy. And they start singing back to him. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. That didn't help the insecurities that Saul had at all. (laughs) No. (laughs) No. Saul should have been at least, okay, if you're not going to lead the charge into the battle, then you should at least lead the parade that's thanking right. the guy that got the victory. Yeah, throw a party and say this this guy is pretty good. Yeah. 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 He did. He wanted David gone. I really think, and th- this this is making arguments on the silence of scripture. So let me let me offer that as a precursor. But I think that as this story unravels, there is a support for this view that would say. Saul would have been just as happy for Goliath to kill David. Maybe happier yeah. than David to kill Goliath. Now, I know I know that, that the songs hadn't been sung yet, mm. the victories hadn't been won, and the accolades weren't there, but he was already threatened by the anointing that David had. But for sure, when he brought that head in, swinging that bloodied head of Goliath, and Saul heard the screaming and the hollering and the singing. He knew from his carnal perspective, David's got to go. He's got to go. Mm-hmm. So here comes the girl. Or here I should say, girl. here comes the snare. That's it. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's, let's read that again. All right. So we're going First Samuel 18, verse 20. And Michael, yeah. Saul's daughter, loved David... 
And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her, that she may be a snare to him, Hmm. and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in one of the twain. Right. Right. So, um, there is a an interesting thing that we got to talk about here, just for a moment. The, the context, the greater context of this passage is, okay, first of all, remember that this, this is already an agreement that whoever kills Whoever kills Goliath yep. gets my daughter's hand in marriage. That's right. Okay. But just a few verses before what you read, it came to pass at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David. She was given to Adriel, her wife, another man, got the eldest daughter of Saul. It's interesting here, and this is this ties back to the question that you asked me about, how do I get caught up in a snare? Mm-hmm. How does a relationship get me? I think, I think the benchmark has to be that you have to begin loving it. There was no love between Merab and David. The love was between Michael and David. So Merab is given to another man that technically she should have been given to David. But I believe that the devious, demonic, even, well, we know it's described as evil uh, spirit that was motivating Saul, caused him to look across the landscape and go, man, i got to get rid of this guy. He will be the end of me. How can I get rid of him? And he sees, you can tell when someone loves each other. Mm-hmm. He sees when, when David comes into the palace, how, how, how Michael spruces up just a little bit extra. He sees those looks that are going between David and Michael, and he knows that they love each other. And so he says to, her, to them, let's, let's give Michael, let's give Michael to David. I can use Michael to my advantage to accomplish my devious intent because David loves her and she loves David. So I am going to take advantage of the relationship that they have to accomplish what I am wanting to accomplish Hmm. to preserve my, my, my king, my kingdom. It takes love. Saul was happy. You hear me? He was happy oh, yeah. that David and Michael loved each other. You know it. Arranged, arranged marriages were not uncommon in that time frame. But to have an arranged marriage where someone was in love with each other, mm-hmm. the love became the currency that, that Saul said, all right, I, I've got enough to purchase a snare. I can use Michael because they, her and David love each other, I can use that relationship to be a snare to catch David. Hmm. Man, the, the potential manipulation of people that happens when they enter into these relationships, eh? Oh, we can go so practical on this, mm. and, and, and we just need to ask our audience to put, put your own scenarios on here. Mm. But when you love somebody, yeah. they can use that to snare you. Yeah, and we've seen people get into what we would de- describe as an unfortunate relationship that leads them, you know. Uh, yes. Right. And I think, I think a, a, an important question to ask yourself is why? Mm. Are they wanting to enter that relationship with me? Or why should I enter that relationship with them? Mm-hmm. Who is setting it up? Mm. Who's, who's working behind the scenes? So the reality is, is it takes love for a snare to work effectively. Mm-hmm. 
And if you love, love never fails. That's what the Bible says. It never fails. Never. Fails. It's sure to happen, isn't it? <laughs> you can't. You really. You really can't be snared by something effectively that you don't love. Mm. So Saul. Saul. Let's see. Let's see how Saul does it. Saul's sitting there on his unanointed in his unanointed position, sitting there on his throne that he knows David is anointed to, to, to replace him. Yep. And he's going, ah, he appears to be loving Michael right now. Mm-hmm. I already told them that if they killed Goliath, that they could, they could uh, have my daughter's hand in marriage. But let me, let me see, see if I can put him in another conflict. It would appear like this conflict didn't work to get David. So let me see, because I know he loves her. Mm-hmm. Let's see if he's willing to fight for her again. Mm -hmm. So let me put an unattainable and let me put him in a a position Mm -hmm. that the conflict will consume him. Right. While he's trying to acquire that thing that he loves. And so he's put an additional dowry on a daughter that David was already qualified to have. David had already done all the bloodshed that he needed to do to get Michael's hand in marriage. But Saul says, now I want a thousand foreskins of the Philistine. You want what? A hundred, I'm sorry. I think it's a hundred. I want you to bring them in. Yeah, a hundred. A hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Oof. (laughs) Bro! Okay, that's quite a dowry yeah. for this relationship. You could ask, you can ask a man that doesn't think your daughter's worth nothing to do that, and he walks away from your daughter. Yeah, he goes, keep her; she's not worth it. You got to be committed to yeah. follow up on that, right? Yeah, got to be some love. But he used the relationship and those the love that David had for Michael to put him in an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. And his intent was, this will snare him, this will get him. Mm -hmm. He'll never come through this one. The Philistines will get him. They'll get him. Mm -hmm. You've got to be leery of any relationship that has continual evolving conditions that must be met. Oh, man. Wow. Yeah, think about that. For us to continue to be friends, I'm going to have to see this level of commitment out of you. Right. Really? Right. Right. <laughs> if, 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 if the relationship and the conditions surrounding the relationship are continually evolving, you should, you should, you should walk carefully. There could be a snare in there somewhere. Wow. Could be a snare in there. David never missed a beat and said, she's worth it. Hmm. But Saul's sitting there saying, uh, David's love for Michael is going gonna, is gonna to enlist him in a battle that will probably consume him. And so at that point, Michael and David's love for each other became the tip of the, of the javelin that, that Saul began to use to try to kill David with. An interesting um, side note here is, Saul, you'll never get the anointing back that you lost by killing the man that now has it. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) What a horrific waste of time. Oh, man. (laughs) Saul, if you do anything, build a relationship with David. Don't kill him. Yeah. Yeah. The guy that's going to replace you, you should be friends with him. Yes. Yes. He might build you a nice home and give you nice food. (laughs) <laughs> but this is human nature at its finest right here, isn't well, it? Well, it, it, it is. And Saul, Saul understood something. He might not have been anointed, but he understood something about human nature. Mm-hmm. If, if you love something, you'll, you'll be willing to fight for it. Mm-hmm. There, I, I can snare you with something that you love. Could that be why 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 mm-hmm. is so critical? Mm-hmm. Read that. First John two fifteen. Love not yeah. the world, neither the things that are uh, in the world. Oh. Uh, yep. Yeah. 
If, if any, any man, man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's a battle of loves, brethren. It's a battle of loves. You can't be snared by a world you don't love. Mm. Boom. Mm -hmm. Before people fall and get tripped up by the world, they love it. Yeah. They love it. They love its philosophy. They love the tinsel. They love it. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. when, the, when the snare trips, that is an outward manifestation of the condition of a heart mm -hmm. that has already begun bridging itself. Mm -hmm. What you learn to love will quickly become your master. Yeah, that's key. So let me ask you this. Yeah. So we're, we're talking, we're framing this on relationships, you know, world uh, discussion. Yes. But what about, yes. what about um, ideologies or people who love certain labels about themselves or, you know. Traditions. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. Because we see people who can get snared by that kind of stuff in their own life, right? Yeah, I, I, I think um, I think we cheapen this principle that we're talking about to, and we make we leave ourselves vulnerable to think that the only thing that you can build a relationship with is a human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that says it better. Yeah, right. You you can have a relationship with a with a pet. You mm -hmm. can have a relationship um, with, as you said, an ideology. Mm -hmm. Here's one. You can have a relationship with an offense. <laughs> oh, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. You can have a relationship with your perception, your philosophical worldview. Mm -hmm. That, okay, is that not what happens when someone is confronted with truth who is just realizing that what they've embraced up until this point has not been truth? Yep, that's right. Right? They realize maybe there's more. Mm -hmm. How many times have, have you been in a Bible, sitting in a Bible study with someone mm -hmm. who, who has been a Christian mm -hmm. and they've embraced doctrine, but they realize there's a bit more. Mm -hmm. They're at, at that moment of, of wow. Yeah. I, what, I, what do I, I love I, more? Right. Mm-hmm. Competing loves, mm -hmm. competing loves. Uh, and Jesus, Jesus had that. Okay. So Jesus relationship with John mm -hmm. was, was a familial one. Yes. The same as Abraham and Lot. Okay. So John's ministry, he, he didn't get a five year pin, man. Nope. No way. He had a short, a short ministry, and it, the entirety of his ministry was to forerun Jesus Christ, a man that, by his own admission, I'm not saying a man in the sense of um, sacrilege, mm -hmm. but the God man that, by John's own admission, he could not even bend down and, and, and unloose the shoes the latchets on the shoes of Jesus, okay? John ends up, after an effective ministry of introducing Jesus to the world, mm -hmm. he, ends up in, he ends up in jail. Yep. How do you think he felt about his relationship with Jesus at that point? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Talk you know about relationships. He, brother. That's a test. Brother. He wasn't even sure when he got in jail if Jesus was the right one. He sent his disciples to say, would you just ask him, are, are you really him? Yeah. Or have I been hoodwinked by the fact that I loved you? Did you snare me? Have you, have you pulled one over on me? Yeah, questioning, you know, questioning everything at that point. Of course. Because you know it's not going to end well if you're Johnny boy. Well, this goes back to what, right. This goes back to what we said at the beginning. Even the relationships that last go through cycles yeah, of a varying degree of closeness and intimacy. And so here's a man that he spent three and a half years pointing people to, forerunning, preparing the way 
for him. And now he's in a season because he's in jail saying, I sure hope I got the right guy. Is, is this really him? Or should we look for somebody else? Mm-hmm. And Jesus sends back a pretty pointed message to the man that forerun him. Yep. And what do you say in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 11? He said, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Wow. Wow. That word offended there me is, is, is scandal on, or we get the word scandal from that. Mm-hmm. Or another word that is used to describe that is snare. <laughs> oh, nice. Snare. So snared by an offense. Oh. Snared by an offense. Wow. It, it, John, John, please hear me. That's, that's the heartbeat of Jesus. Mm-hmm. At, at this point in your ministry, don't let an offense trip you up. You weren't offended when your disciples left you and started following me. You weren't offended by, by the opposition that you faced in your ministry, having to go and teach in the wilderness. No, no, no. And you know, it almost seems like he was immune to it up until that point. This is the yes. guy who said, look, don't follow me. Yes. He's a man. Get yes. out. Go follow it, him. I'm right. done. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But an offense becomes, okay, what, what, the, 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 the definition goes, goes on to say a stumbling block, mm-hmm. a movable stick or trigger of a trap. Yep. So like you're a not in the trap. Stick. You're not in the trap. For your whole life, it seems like everything is great, and then you step on it, right. and you're in it. The offense becomes the trigger. The offense is not the snare. The offense is the trigger. The offense is not the trap. Mm-hmm. It's it's what makes the trap snap. Hmm. John, don't fall in love with your offense. Don't embrace your offense. Because that will snare you when your relationship does not give you what you were expecting out of it. Mm -hmm. Don't allow the offense that you got because you're not, you're, you didn't get what you're expecting to become what trips the snare that will ultimately take you out. Man, if you're driving in your car right now, that's good. That's pretty good stuff. We know this is helping you today. Wow. That's, we're all there, guys. We're all there. We're all there. We're all there. We all invest in relationships that do not give back to us That's what right. we were expecting. Yep. We are all grappling with divine calls and purposes mm. that ultimately may not hit the heights or depths yeah. that we expected them to hit. Yep. And at that moment, that moment, it shakes us to a core where we go, are you even God? <laughs> or, or do we look somewhere else? Is the whole thing a mirage? Or yeah. or, or is this where a man, if you embrace that line of thinking, that thing becomes the trigger that will ultimately snare you. Wow. So a, a good question to ask is, can we get out of that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So, Pastor McKillop, we're snared. How do we get out? Can we get out? Yeah. We can. So, we got good news. We can. Mm-hmm. And Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy about it mm-hmm. and said, this is where you start. Second Timothy 2, Second. Yeah. 23 says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are oh. taken captive by him at his will. Woo. It starts by starting to ask the right questions and ceasing to ask the wrong ones. Mm-hmm. Avoid foolish questions, mm-hmm. unlearned questions. You know they gender strife. You know they don't make sense, and you know that the answer of them is really immaterial. It's a foolish question. Stop. (laughs) Stop. Then the servant of the Lord has to come in. 
-hmm. And he must not strive, but he has to be gentle. He's got to teach. He's got to be patient. Here is a powerful, powerful verse. And in meekness, he instructs those that oppose themselves. Do you know that the offended aren't fighting the offender? Mm -hmm. They're fighting themselves. They're opposing themselves. That wow. is the point. That is the point where preaching steps in, teaching. The servant of the Lord comes in, and you walk in and you sit down on a pew, mm -hmm. and the man of God opens the Word of God, and he's got a set of snips, yep. 10 snips, and he's coming after you. Not to cut you, but to cut the snare. That's right. And in meekness, he's going, stop asking those questions. You, yep. you, you can't get the answers that you're searching for by asking. To get the right answer, you've got to ask the right question. Mm -hmm. Stop asking the wrong question. Let me teach and you. you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let me with patience mm -hmm. teach you. I want to gently approach you. I want to in meekness instruct you, son. You're opposing yourself. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're harming yourself. And those that embrace that, the Bible says God gives them a chance to repent, that they can come to the acknowledgement of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Out of the snare of the devil. Mm -hmm. You know what that word there is? What, what the de definition there means to recover themselves. Hmm. It means to awake to soberness. Wow. In other words, when you are struggling with offense, struggling with bitterness, struggling with relationships, maybe it's people. Mm hmm and you're snared by it, it becomes something that intoxicates you. It affects a man that's intoxicated is a man that doesn't think right. He doesn't talk right. He doesn't walk right. Mm -hmm. He doesn't interact with the rest of the world right. He's intoxicated. When you are snared, you are intoxicated. But... If you will embrace the servant of the Lord, who in meekness is teaching you, saying, come on out, come on out, you will recover yourself. It's, it's the same way almost as the prodigal son when the Bible says he came yeah. to himself. Yeah, it gives you, the, it gives you the, the understanding that he wasn't him, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So a combination of stopping the wrong kind of ignorant questioning and listening intently to the right instruction will enable one to free themselves from being held captive at, their own, <laughs> at the devil's will. Oh, oh that's so good. There's help yeah. right there. You, waited, you yeah. waited an hour to hear that. That's, wow. What a message. That's the takeaway. That's the takeaway. I get the mental image of, you know, a shepherd coming to his sheep in a snare and you, as an, an animal in a snare struggles and struggles and struggles. And the more they struggle, the tighter yep. it gets. Right. Right. And you got to say, and, okay, and, calm down, stop struggling. Yes. Let me help you. Which so well said. Absolutely. Cause it is impossible. It is impossible for you to recover yourself from a snare by yourself. You're not doing it. You're not doing it. It'll never happen. It always requires exterior outside help. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that you do is while your foot is still in the snare, change the line of questioning and then listen to the man that's instructing you in meekness. That's how you recover from the snare.